Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Corby Connection. Tonight, we have with us a special friend of us here at Gettysburg, Dr. Va Dominic Vachon. Dominic has a long list of uh, achievements there at the University of Notre Dame, so we're going to get right to it and bring in your host, Pat Colley. Pat? Thank you, Rick, and thank you, Dominic Bashan, for your time. Uh, we were chatting a little bit before we got going here about how your relationship with the Notre Dame Club of Gettysburg goes back to at least 2011 when you delivered yeah. a Hesburgh lecture to us in Gettysburg. Um, but in particular, then, you know, you form some very special relationships with our club and at least one member, uh, our, our club member, John Steinauer, um, yes. you and he hit it off and, and you then in the next year made arrangements for John and his family to, to come out to the Notre Dame Michigan football game and arrange for their uh, getting around campus and so forth. I just would love to hear because that made you an instant and, and permanent friend of the Notre Dame Club of Gettysburg. And, wow. and so tell me about, about that experience and uh, what your recollections of John uh, oh, are. Thanks. It's great to be with you guys. I love your club. I love the, you guys are doing great things. I still get your newsletters and everything. Um, but when I was there for a Hesburgh lecture in 2011, I met John Steinauer and, um, and, you know, became part of the, his, one of his followers, you know, just uh, his charisma uh, and his involvement with the club. I mean, he was there at every meeting of your club. He was involved in a lot of service projects. Um, anyway, I got to be friends with him and my talk was on um, compassion in medicine, I think, something like that at the time. And that friendship kind of continued and I actually visited Gettysburg again uh, later on with my family. And so that friendship just kind of kept going. But uh, what happened, I think it was in 2012, um, John was starting to <clears throat> um, fail and um, his family was, and you all were like, let's see if we can get him at a game. And I think it was the Michigan game. Um, I'm not positive about that. But anyway, it all worked out. And he and, he, uh, and his brother and maybe some of you guys came for the game. And um, I'm one of the faculty advisors for the Notre Dame Bagpipe Band, and I play bagpipes with them. And I said to the bagpipe uh, member, the students in the bagpipe band, I said, you know, this, this guy, John Steinauer, is a real uh, amazing guy. And we gave awards periodically. And I'm like going, can we, let, can we give him an award? I said, because this guy... He was a special Olympian. He is a special Olympian. And he does some really neat things in Gettysburg. And they were like, of course. And so uh, we prepared to give him the award. And we were, uh, we were, I was a little worried about overwhelming John. Um, uh, but there were, there were two reasons that that didn't happen. Number one, John made friends throughout campus. There are dozens of pictures with John with many students around campus. And then the other thing that happened was it was right by the bookstore and he and his brother were coming to the dome. And I said, John, I just wanted to make sure he wasn't gonna be overwhelmed by it all because there's gonna be a lot of people right there in front of the dome. And I said, John, we would really like to give you an award. Is that okay with you? And he said, oh yes. You know, and it just just drank it in. And I said, okay, John, I said, we would really like to give you an award. So we had our concert, which is our usual practice in front of the dome on a home football Saturday. And at a certain point, we called John up to give him the award and basically talk about his achievements, but then also talk about his magic that, that whoever becomes friends with John gets to know John. Uh, he brings out the best in people and he makes people more loving and compassionate than they were before. And so uh, we had a, this award, we made it. And at that same time, the bells were really tolling right on Sacred, by, in Sacred Heart. And we're like going, what is going on? You know, because that wasn't coordinated, but talk about a celebration. You know, we were giving them the award, award and the bells just kept tolling, but I don't know why, but they were really celebrating and we were like going, it's John, and John has the, John has the, 
the Mary and God and everybody else joining in because it was just a big celebration. And, and, and really, it's one of the most precious and important things I've ever gotten to do uh, was to, uh, to be friends with John and to be able to give him that award, which he just soaked in. It was just wonderful. I have some pictures. Can I show you the pictures? Yes, please do. So um, this, this picture is right after we gave him the award. Uh, we made it a very Notre Dame award. We had Notre Dame coins on it, a bagpiper, and then a special recognition. And that's the Notre Dame bagpipe. And you can see all the people who were around. So it was really, you know, there were hundreds of people around. And oh, people were so enthusiastic after we read uh, things about John. And then uh, I have another picture from your newsletter. Uh, here he is. Oops, no, wrong one. Um, oh, it's not, it's not working. Yeah, no, that, uh, it, that came through. I saw did? your... Okay. Yeah, uh, here he is with uh, his brother right there. You can see that he is well-dressed for the occasion. And I'm not kidding you, we have uh, several dozen pictures of him with students in the marching band. And, you know, he just, uh, he just added a lot to the day. It was, it was amazing, it was wonderful. So- You know, before we got started, you, you I, we, I was expressing that we were so happy to have you join us because you did so much for, for one of our members, John. And, and you were sort of taken aback and you said, well, I'm having, all I'm remembering is what John did for me. Tell yes. me a little bit about that. Well, um, like I said, when we were recognizing him, um, I just thought that John, you know, John, like I said, made, brought out the best in everybody there. I mean, you all had him at all your meetings, which really impressed me. Uh, and then as I got to know him, I understood why you liked him there, because he added a lot of spirit to everything. Uh, and his love for Notre Dame and his enthusiasm. Uh, and so for me, he really touched me. Uh, and then I got to know his family a little bit. And, you know, I thought this is this is what living is all about, you know, being able to give and receive compassion from each other. And John exemplified that. You know, he gave and he received, and it was fun to do both. It was fun to receive from John, and it was fun to give to John. Just like when around the bookstore, when I said, John, you know, can we give you an award? And he just drank it in, and I thought, John has a lot to teach us. Uh, and, so, um, and so when I found out I was going to be talking to you all, I had the pictures right here on my computer, and um, it was great to, to think about him. You know, in everything you just said about how he brought out the best in other people through his enthusiasm is such a perfect way to frame a conversation about what it is you do at Notre Dame um, and what you try to work with people in helping professions, especially healthcare professions, to do. Mm -hmm. um, so you are the director of the Hillebrand Center for Compassionate Care in Medicine, and you are also the author of How Doctors Care, the science of compassionate and balanced caring in medicine. So, you know, what I've been fascinated about while preparing for this conversation was learning about exactly what the, the kinds of traits you're describing in John about the, the, yes. the value of what happens when you empathize with, with what a person is going through as the professional who's providing that help. So tell me a bit about what, what does the Center for Compassionate Care in Medicine yes. do? And actually, I can relate it well to John because John exemplifies a lot of that. Uh, the Hillebrand Center for Compassion Care and Medicine has been around since 2011. It was begun first. It's have, had several major gifts given to it. But the first person was Ruth Hillebrand, who was a psychologist practicing in Manhattan. She was from Toledo. And she was told bad news about having terminal mesothelioma over the phone when she was alone at home one night. And after the physician told her, he hung up. And so what happened was, you know, not only did she have the bad news of what she was gonna go through, but how it was told to her. 
Now, she must have been a remarkable person because she turned that harshness into kind of a vision of kindness and basically gave her estate to the University of Toledo Medical School and to Notre Dame through her brother, Joseph. And the idea it was because Notre Dame has so many people going into health professions, especially medicine, the idea was to start training people even before medical school in terms of having a heart of caring. And so that's how it all started. And I'm a medical psychologist who was doing training of new physicians and working on compassion, science of compassion. And so Notre Dame started that and uh, recruited me for it. And I'm like going, I have to do this. This is wonderful, you know? And so um, basically we do two things that are unique. One is we do this new area called science of compassion. And what I mean by science of compassion is that we are now able to study the biology of compassion, the neuroscience of compassion, the psychology of compassion, like how we're built for compassion. This is a new area and it's, and it's improving the way we train people going into healthcare and the way we help people in healthcare take care of themselves. And it turns out that compassion is good for patients, but it's really good for us as healthcare providers. And so when people get really overwhelmed and burnt out, they think they've got to get rid of compassion, but it's actually compassion that keeps us going. And now we can kind of prove that scientifically. So that's one of the things we get to do. Uh, and the second thing we get to do, we, we do a lot of continuing medical education uh, at different places in the country, but the main thing we do is we begin this training at the undergraduate level. So when they go to medical school or whatever school in health professions that they go to, they get bombarded with a lot of information. It's very stressful. It's a very hard time to learn about what does it mean to have a compassion in a scientific way be your core. So uh, the Notre Dame experiment is really, let's start now. Let's start at the undergrad years. And now our graduates are already at the second year residency level. And the feedback we we're getting is overwhelming that the seeds that are planted at Notre Dame just keep growing and they're planted before they're under lots of stress. Now back to John, you know, this is about being human. This is not just about being in medicine. Uh, that we humans are, are at our best and our happiest when we're able to give and receive compassion. And, and when I think of Notre Dame Club Gettysburg and I think of John, I think of that wonderful magic that we human beings are built to give and receive to each other. And that's when we're happiest. Uh, that's, that's what it's all about. I think one of the key ideas that you just touched on and starting early with the undergraduates is that somebody, somebody who's in the College of Science probably uh, thinking they're going to go to medical school or maybe they're going to a career in nursing or physical therapy, they are first and foremost focused on what they call the hard sciences. So the <laughs> biochemistry, the, you know, the physics and all of that. And one theme throughout what you, where, what you have said and written elsewhere is you don't buy into that dichotomy between hard sciences and what they might call a soft science like wow. psychology or the fluffy stuff at all. You think it's a, at least as important. And in fact, it's measurable as you've just described yeah. uh, the benefits of compassion uh, as part of their training. Well, thank you for noticing that because uh, yeah, I have a, a chapter on, on that and I, uh, I'd say to my students and people that I get to work with, I say there are no things such, there's no such thing as the hard sciences and the soft sciences. It's the hard sciences and the harder sciences. I said, you can pick which one yours is, but, but this is one of the hard or harder sciences. Uh, and we can really back that up because when people call it soft, it automatically disposes them to think that it's not as important. Uh, but it is the core of what we do. In, in one of the classes, we have a, a, a final exam at the end. It's an oral final exam. And we have a trick question in there. And we go, would you rather have a smart doctor or a caring doctor? 
And, uh, and you know, if they pick either one, they get it wrong. Is because both the right that, answer? That, yes. Like, you know, a, a truly smart doctor knows how um, that caring is the way you deliver your competence, the way you deliver your skills. Uh, and if you really are a caring person, you're going to make yourself as sharp and as smart as you can in your field. Uh, because it's not enough to be warm-hearted in medicine. You've got to be have your knowledge, but then you've got to be interested in giving that to the person in front of you. And so um, the key the key phrase for us is being into it. So you can have the best healthcare person in the world in front of you, you know, all awards and smart and everything else. But if they're not into your problem, their smarts are worthless. Um, and so what counts is, the ability of that person to take their competence, their training, and apply it to you. And this applies to surgeons, researchers, I mean, because anything that you focus your attention on another human being to help relieve their suffering, that's compassion. So and you've explained elsewhere too that, I mean, to put this in sort of practical terms so people can have an image of how this plays out, you've described the, uh, mm -hmm. the idea of the doctor who comes into a, a meeting with a patient and they have in mind certain data points that they need to obtain to crunch mm -hmm. the numbers and, and adjust meds or do what they need to do. But that comes off uh, to the patient as they're not there to see the, per the patient as a person, to listen to what's yes. important to the patient. They're only concerned what's, a, it, what's important to their medical brain. So they're sort of cut off from that compassion. And I thought the most fascinating thing that I've seen you explain is that there is actually, it, it can be measured that the patient within a very short period of time will pick up on that and then will act accordingly. So if the, if the doctor's not opening up a safe, trusting space, that patient's not going to volunteer information that might be crucial. That's exactly right, Pat. When we, we have this course at Notre Dame where we have patient actors and we demonstrate this, we show this, that how that first 30 seconds, that patient is unconsciously picking up whether they're safe with you or not, whether they can trust you or not, and whether you're really genuine in your care for them. Uh, and, and, and it's not just for, quote, patient satisfaction. Uh, when I meet doctors who are like going, well, what about medical outcomes and what about the data? I'm like going, it's absolutely, it, uh, we've found out that compassion is related to better medical outcomes. The other thing that happens is when a patient feels connected to you and when they trust you and feel safe with you, they give you more information. And when uh, a person like a doctor, a nurse practitioner, a PA, a therapist gets better information, they can give better treatment. And then when people feel like they can trust you, they are more likely to follow through on what you recommend. So it helps everything. Um, so, um, and, and the science is really showing this over and over again that, you know, this is not just about warm heartedness and uh, how, how wonderful, I mean, everybody loves compassion. Uh, this is about, this makes the biggest difference. Um, yes, and, and you were saying too that it's, you know, there's this tendency to, to favor what they might think of as the hard science and I need that medical data because I need a certain wow. outcome and I guess I need to make room now uh, because Dr. Vashon is telling me to make room for compassion, but I think that for you it's yes. all about integration of it and not compartmentalizing that compassion. Exactly. You know, there's that tendency, we've all heard somebody hear of another human being who did something extraordinary and they think about themselves and say, well, I'm no Mother Teresa, and they sort of compartmentalize that part of them, yes, whereas yes. You've, you've already said, no, it's a, it's a core part of you, and it's about integrating the, the, the data points with the ability to connect with, with the, the person yeah. you're having. And there's all kinds of ways of connecting with people, you know, so there's a range of really good communication styles that work for people. Uh, when people go see uh, doctors and nurses and so on, they actually are open to quite a bit. The key thing is they are keyed in on, are you really, are you genuinely who you are presenting yourself to be? Uh, and can I trust you? 
And once they, they sense that, then uh, it, it goes. And, and, that's, and when people do that phrase, you know, I'm no Mother Teresa, I'm, you know, it, it, it makes it sound like compassion is an extraordinary or rare thing. And it's actually the core of everything we do. Uh, and the paradoxical thing that happens is that when, now again, this is human. This is true for all of us as human, not just doctors. But when we cut ourselves off from that part of ourselves, we actually, um, we, we lose the joy of what we do, that we get to help people uh, with this. Um, and so when you cut yourself off, you know, what happens is people say, well, it's so hard being with people who are suffering. Well, it's like, yes, it is, but it's the thing that most matters in our lives. And so be there in the way that you can be there, be present to them. Even if you can't do anything, be with them, accompany them. And that makes a world of difference uh, to them. And that, and that actually is the most fulfilling way to live, you know, to be able to give and receive from each other. And, and that leads into one other topic I wanted to talk about, which is sort of the flip side of uh, engaging in empathy and compassion uh, when there is suffering, especially in healthcare professions. I, I think we've all seen over the last 12 months the photos and read the stories of the healthcare yeah. professionals who are physically, mentally, spiritually yes. drained. They haven't seen their families for long periods of time, yes. and they are surrounded by suffering and death on a scale that they hadn't been seeing before. And of yes. course, certain specialties like uh, oncology or maybe working in an ICU, I mean, this is nothing new. They're, they're always engaged in this. So how do you explore that with healthcare professionals where they're they're supposed to empathize and show compassion, but they're being bombarded themselves with such yes. suffering. I mean, what role does compassion play for the betterment of the healthcare profession there? Well, that's huge. Uh, we're actually, uh, we have two projects where, one where we're supporting people in ICU units uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but we have another thing going on where we are interviewing physicians in ICUs and emergency rooms in terms of how do they mentally get ready for this and then how do they keep themselves going and then how do they restore themselves afterwards and what they say over and over again is um, th it's like running a marathon every single day and it's it's and, and it's the, one of the hardest things they've ever had to do and it's like a war zone and it's hard. And like, uh, especially at the beginning, we didn't know what COVID was, how it spread, how dangerous it was, how to treat people, um, and all kinds of difficulties when people came in, people denying that they had it and all kinds of things. And then people dying without loved ones there. And the nurse or the physician is actually holding the iPad so that they can say goodbye, you know? Um, but what really comes through in this is, I mean, number one, this is emotionally really hard. I mean, when you are in a compassion mindset, it's not like you are oblivious to the suffering. You really feel it. But on the other hand, it's sort of like what happens, what they say to us is, this is what I was built to do. Now, we weren't built to do marathons every single day. But this is what I was built to do. And we humans, this is what we're all built to do. So we've all gone through these really hard things in the last year. And when we're at our best is we go, yeah, this is really hard, uh, but what am I able to offer? And, and let me keep doing it until I can't do it anymore. And I've had some physicians who say, you know, this has been one of the roughest years of my life, but the core of this is, I'm really clear is, is my compassion. And, and, and you have to figure out how to balance that, you know, so... You do what you can, but you can't do everything. But what really gets you into trouble is if you cut yourself off. Because then you're cutting yourself off from the source of what keeps you going. Because what keeps you going is the desire to notice people's suffering and try to, to alleviate it. That's what keeps us going. So when you cut that off, you might cut off the pain, but then you've cut off really helping people. So it's paradoxical, it's tricky ground, but uh, you know, if, we, and if, you, if you just think about anything in your life where a loved one was going through something 
and you are like reaching out automatically, even if it's hard, that's what we're talking about. That's the thing in we human beings that these doctors and nurses and therapists have been doing all year long. But again, like you said, it's grueling, it's really hard. But compassion is not to blame in that. You know, what, what's hard in it is there's so many people who've gotten sick and died. That's the problem. And that there's not enough resources and people to do it. But compassion's not the problem there. And sometimes people think, gosh, I'm helping suffering people. It feels hard. Let me get rid of the feeling. And you can understand why people would do that. It makes sense. But it's actually that compassion piece is actually what keeps you going uh, and saying, you know, this is what it's all about. This is what we do. This is what I was built for. So it's, it's a both and kind of thing. You know, you're going through it. It's really hard. But on the other hand, you go, but this is what I do, you know, but, <laughs> but we need more people and we need to keep supporting people who are doing this. That's the real issue. And, and we need insurance companies to pay for the time it takes to show compassion and we need enough PPE and we need face masks and all of that. So, yeah. you, you know, there's a reason why the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic described you as one of the unsung heroes well, in the healthcare you. professions. And, and it's because that's what we found out in the last 12 months, if we didn't know it already, is you know, we just, we didn't know what we weren't ready for. And yep. this compassion is, is going to be the glue that holds many of the professionals together and allows for greater outcomes with the patients. So I, I'm just indebted to you for, for providing Thank such you. a fascinating topic to us um, and for, for what you did for John Steinauer. And of course, you are always welcome in Gettysburg and we hope you do okay. make another visit. Uh, but I will turn it back over to Rick and, and with thank my you. thanks, Dr. Vashon. Thank you very much, Pat. Really appreciate you inviting me to be here. And I love the Notre Dame Club of Gettysburg. And I am looking forward to getting back there. I love you guys. Thank you very much, Dr. Vashon. Uh, this is Rick again. And uh, just let you know that uh, just let you know that you will always be a special friend to us here in Gettysburg. And like Pat said, you're always welcome to come back to see us. And uh, I know I can speak for myself and all of us here at Gettysburg. We cannot wait for this pandemic to be over so we can get back on campus to, uh, to take in that bagpipe, which you is bet. a great, great uh, way to, uh, to, to do, do our weekend out there at Notre Dame. You bet. Uh, you, you guys do a great job. And like I said, you're always a special friend for us here. Again, you're welcome to come back. And it's great to see you again. You take care you, of yourself and God bless you for what you do for the University of Notre Dame and everyone that you touch. Thank you very much. And thank you for what you do for us and how, uh, how you've lifted my heart and many other hearts. And especially thinking of John and, and the Steinauer family as well. Again, we thank you very much. And as usual, the way we end this, go Irish. Go Irish. Yeah.